Welcome to Riding Westward. I'm your host, Brendan Rensink. If we think about the crises we face today in the American West, and how a novel or other piece of creative fiction might project what dangers they might present for the future, or how we might avoid the worst of them, environmental concerns, drought, climate change, or geopolitical unrest would perhaps be at the forefront of our minds. But trans species and transgenic livestock with human skin, naked porcupines with monkey hands, sentient military-grade murder robots, or post-Civil War fractured multi-state alliances in the American West probably would not be on our list. Finding an evolutionary biologist and professor combining all of these things and more into a novel adaptation of Shakespeare's King Lear seems even more unlikely. Nevertheless, that is what we have this month, as we talk with Professor Stephen L. Peck about his novel, The Tragedy of King Lear, The Goat Herd of the LaSalles. Buckle up. This is a wild one. For new listeners, let me take a quick moment to explain a bit about the podcast. Each episode features a conversation with authors, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, academics, or others who write about the North American West. Our goal is to not only showcase their work, but to spark curiosity among you, the listeners, to think more deeply about the region, its lands and environments, and the histories and experiences of the people who call it home. If a writer intrigues you, you can find links to their work in the show notes or at writingwestward.org. And if you have a moment, please do subscribe, share links with friends, leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using to listen. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and send in some feedback. Writing Westward is supported by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University, where I, Brendan Rensink, serve as Associate Director and an Associate Professor of History. For better or worse, this is a one-man operation, with me playing the roles of host, producer, sound engineer, and just about everything else, all of which entail tasks for which I have very little training. But I am passionate about the North American West, and all the work is well worth the excuse to read more and to talk to interesting people. At the end of this episode, I will include some more information on me and my scholarship and on the Red Center, our programming and projects and funding opportunities that you could apply for. That's right, we may want to give you money. With all this business out of the way, let's move on to today's conversation. First, I'd like to introduce to you who it is we're talking to and why. Stephen L. Peck is an evolutionary biologist and associate professor in the College of Life Sciences at Brigham Young University. In addition to being a widely published scholar in genomics, entomology, mathematical modeling, and other associated fields, Peck moonlights as a writer of creative fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and essays. These writings range from religion to the environment and from magic realism to science fiction. Many are set in the American West, especially around his hometown landscapes of Moab, Utah. His novels and shorter works have won numerous awards. Most recently, the Association for Mormon Letters recognized his body of work with the 2021 Smith Pettit Foundation Award for Outstanding Contribution to Mormon Letters. Today we speak with Professor Peck about his most recent novel, The Tragedy of King Lear, The Goatherd of the LaSalles, published in 2019 by Common Consent Press. It is an adaptation of Shakespeare's King Lear. On the one hand, the outlines of the adaptation are quite faithful to the original. But the futuristic setting in a post-apocalyptic American West is wildly inventive. Shakespeare couldn't have imagined the mega droughts, military-grade sentient murder robots, transgenic livestock, or post-war geopolitically fractured American West that Peck uses to retell the story of Lear's descent into madness. In Peck's adaptation, Lear is a goat rancher of global significance, based in the LaSalle Mountains outside of Moab, Utah. In spinning Lear's tale in this wild setting, Peck points us to dangers apparent in our present American West. Greed, climate change, indifference to the human impact on the environment and ecology, and our desperate dependence on the same. Casting our eyes to a future West, however fantastical and bizarre, Peck offers a warning voice of tragedies that we should and can avoid. Professor Stephen L. Peck, welcome to Writing Westward. Oh, thank you, Brendan. This is fantastic. This is the first time I've interviewed someone from my home campus, and I'm really happy to do so. I had this idea when I saw the book came out a while ago 
but then I saw you in a parking lot at a trailhead. I had just finished trail running. I think you were just heading out on a hike. And I thought, oh, yeah. there's Steve. I need to interview him for the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I really enjoyed reading this book. It is something of a trip. I read the first half of it last week or two weekends ago. Um, I was camping down in the San Rafael Swell, kind of surrounded oh. by red rock canyon walls, which I thought was a good setting. Yes. Um, as I was reading the first half. And then I finished the book out last weekend as I was in a fevered delirium from my second Moderna shot, which actually <laughs> turned out to be quite fitting for the second half of this book, kind of like a, a fevered, yeah. delirious state. So it worked out perfectly. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I, I, I could recommend that to everybody for their <laughs> second shot. <laughs> I want to start by talking a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to the specifics of this book eventually. But can you tell us a little bit about your growing up in Moab and perhaps what kind of relationship you had in that childhood and growing up there with these iconic Western landscapes? I mean, within kind of an hour or two of Moab, you have kind of every iconic type of Western landscape and environment you could think of. So yeah. how, did, how, yeah. how, did, how did that build in you as you grew up? It was, it was interesting how I think it framed me, but at the time I didn't really appreciate what I had. I, I roamed the hills all the time. I, I, I hiked. I knew the places that no tourist would ever go. And it was just a place to live. I, I mean, I didn't really, we'd moved there when I was, I think, in ninth grade. It was interesting because there were so many places to visit and do, but it was growing up, I didn't really realize what I had, but all the while I'm developing this love of the land, I'm developing kind of a, uh, uh, innate ecological sensibility that would eventually lead me into becoming a biologist. And, and I think it almost became who I was in a way I, I wrote this poem called Red Rock Runs Through My Veins. And that's how it felt. I bonded with the land. I, If I have a sense of place anywhere in the world, it's Moab. I'm comfortable there. I feel like the land welcomes me. I feel like it's home. I ne growing up, I never thought, wow, this is a great, beautiful place, because I didn't have any other context for where I was Everywhere I lived, it was just a place, and Moab was just a place, and it wasn't until I left, interestingly, that I read Edward Abbey and began to, to say, oh, wait, this place is unique in the world. And, and so uh, growing up there, I feel really lucky because I got to know so many places there. We'd go to the LaSalle's all the time as a youth on activities. That's where we'd camp. We'd go up and down the Colorado and I had friends and uh, that had rafts and we'd go run the, the river. And uh, of course, we were way more dangerous than we should have been. We didn't re <laughs> We were all good swimmers and thought, oh, why would we need a a life jacket, which kills a lot of people every year. But, <laughs> but you did all these but, things just as a resident. It was just yeah. where you lived, whereas everyone else comes and does all these exact same activities there, but as a tourist, as an outsider coming right. in to enjoy the magic of this landscape. R right, um, right. Even tourists who come there regularly, how is your view of that land different than other people who maybe spent just as many hours hiking or rafting as you did? Maybe more. You take a place for granted, I think, when you live there because you don't, I don't know, appreciate what you have. But in a way, I wandered more broadly and I think to places tourists would never go, like climbing the hills just outside of Moab that have no trails. And and of course, growing up, I'd never heard of cryptogramic soils or anything like that. We just wander. And I can remember, I don't know if I should admit this, but I don't remember wearing shoes in the summer and going hiking. And I, I had friends and we just grabbed sleeping bags and we just walk through the desert areas and, and camp under the stars and have those great conversations that you always have when you're isolated and alone. And I think I engaged with it in ways that probably 
aren't available anymore. The way that we yeah. just wander through through the hills and hike in canyons that were hard to get to and hidden. And I think I may know places tourists don't know about that should be on every map and hiking trail around, but I, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to well, tell. <laughs> no, you need to keep those to yourself. I mean, we could, yeah. we could channel a lot of Ed Ab, your gym styles and, you know, lament, yeah. you know, the, the touristification, that's not a word, but, uh, you know, yeah, the, the, like the development of, of the area and, and some of that magic that's lost and being able to easily find remote places. But that is interesting. I grew up in Northwest Washington in a real magical place on the coast with a mountain range in town, enormous green spaces throughout the city and mountain biking trails and hiking trails, you know, five minutes from my house. And I loved it. Yeah. And I didn't appreciate it till I left. Because we just, yeah, we wandered and we just went lots of random places, which had its own magic. But right. as I now go back and research about the area more, and I realize how many places I didn't go to, right? All of these things that uh, I should have been more intentional about trying to really <laughs> yeah. get the most out of all of all of this. And so now when I go back yeah. and visit, I, it's it's strange, but I kind of visit now as a tourist who wants to like go check all these different places off a list, these things I've never seen before. Whereas when I just grew up there, I just just wandered around, which was great in its own way, but yeah, it is a little yeah, bit different it, relationship. It, and I, I've got friends who live there and I regularly go back and we typically do a, a hike a year uh, somewhere that's a little bit different and off the map. And, and I'm way more ecologically sensitive about about areas but it's still fun to go places that aren't labeled as yeah. such and you, and, you, and you see some of that in 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 my books the yeah. um, the places that i mention are all real and especially in the lasalles which i think are underappreciated um that that whole area is magical i mean it, it I really think the LaSalle's is lasalles are definitely underappreciated in that people go to moab for red rock desert right and so now if you travel all the way to Moab, you're going there for arches and canyon lands and the red rock or mountain biking. And if I'm going out of Moab, I'm not going to go up into these mountains. Like we have mountains like that yeah. elsewhere, right? Right, um, right. Which maybe keeps them kind of sh shielded and protected from, from overuse. I don't know. Perhaps. <laughs> the, um, the second highest mountain in Utah is in the LaSalle Range, Mount Peel. And so yeah. it's, and it, you're right, it is sensitive. There's lots of crazy things going on there now with the release of the goats and the, yep. and and I, I wish more people realized how fragile those blackaliths are and and saw it in terms of just the beauty that's possible to see there you get some views from the top of the south into the canyon lands that that still haunt me. I mean, yeah. the, the look, looking down into the canyon lands from the top of the LaSalle is just breathtaking. But yeah, it's from also, 1,400 feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so cool. <laughs> That's kind of at the heart of this book, the fragility of of these lands. Um, But so you then go on to get degrees. I'm looking at your CV here in computer science, statistics and computer science, environmental biostatistics, and biomathematics, which I have no idea what any of these things mean. Um, what leads you then to... I don't to... either, so. <laughs> uh, I mean, because as we're going to see, uh, your book here is, you know, it's, it's creative writing, but what leads you down an academic career path as an evolutionary biologist? So that was sort of my uh, focus in all of those. Uh, I had that, an opportunity at BYU. They had this... Um, camp up at Tenth Lodge before it had become so developed and commercialized in a way. And we'd go up there and take ecology classes. And while I was there, the one of the professors, Dr. Shizau, had a tremendous influence on my entire life. But something he, that he said, I think in particular, uh, framed the rest of my life, I was at the time a philosophy biology major, zoology, actually, back when they had a zoology program. And we were up there and we were looking at an ecosystem. We were, I think we were in the Aspens talking about 
owls or something. I can't remember. He was teaching us our ecology class and we were looking at transitional zones. And he said, you know, if you want to be an ecologist, which was my aim, he said, you, you have to learn some math because that's the language that science speaks in. And, and he did a lot of ecological modeling mathematically. And he said, forget a philosophy. You don't know enough math. Start taking math classes. And it was true. I mean, my math, this, this seems ironic now, but my math background was essentially consumer math in high school. And I, I showed up at BYU and took Math 100D, which was the lowest level to catch you up so you could take college math classes. But I did. I said, OK, if I'm going to be an ecologist, I have to learn math. And I got a little carried away. <laughs> uh, For the next 10 years, she took math classes. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. But the, but the focus, uh, for example, at um, NC State in their biomath program, I was a joint entomology major. They had joint PhDs where you would take the classes for both programs and then do a joint dissertation. So uh, all the time, and I was focused on insect ecology, and the whole my whole focus even in um, in biostatistics was taking. I minored in, um, uh, or they called it something else, like else like an emphasis, but it was ecology, and I took wetlands ecology classes, and so, so that was always my, the application. My, yeah, yeah, and, and so I. I and I did a minor in zoology. I had enough credits. I took everything but physiology and cell biology because that was a scale I didn't care about <laughs> for, for, for the zoology minor. But I they had a joint program in computer science and statistics. And and just following Dr. Shizawa's advice, I really started trying to, to capture ecology quantitatively because that was that was the way you talked about it in ecology uh not neglecting however being in ecology as well and learning the processes and things and so that's kind of how i ended up in that direction because it sounds i think i i don't know if this is true but i'm one of the few people in the life sciences who none of my degrees are actually in biology except a half entomology degree from NC State. But. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about some of these hard sciences, though, is that, you know they are very interdisciplinary, and there's so many different tool sets that you guys use that sometimes your degree isn't a certain thing, but it's because you needed that tool set to apply to all kinds of adjacent fields. So I mean, right. the more I, the more that I get to know you guys in the life sciences colleges here at BYU, the more I realize you're doing a lot of very very different things. So, yeah, as you're, true. Yeah. so as you're doing all of this, then well, we have some hints of it because you were originally a philosophy major, but when do you start uh, doing poetry and creative writing? I mean, I scroll through your CV and it is a bizarre CV of, <laughs> of uh, these papers and publications uh, on these sciencey topics that make no sense to me, interspersed with essays on religion and philosophy and creative writing and poetry. Um, I, I assume it's probably the weirdest CV in your college. Maybe your colleagues <laughs> make fun of you. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think so. So, so when did you start you, using this outlet or this way of expression with poetry and creative writing? And then maybe with that, we'll, we'll turn to, the, to, your, to your book that we're talking about today. It, it, it actually started in seventh grade. I was severely bullied, but the teacher had us write poems. I wrote this long, epic poem about a weasel, and it was very moving. It, so much so, she had me read it in front of the class because she liked it so much. And I looked down, and that bully had a tear coming out of his eye, as you know, the, the final wrap up. And he came up to me after, he, and he said, Heck, that's the best thing you've ever done. <laughs> Did he stop bullying you then? No, <laughs> for a little while I had a, I had a had a week respite, but <laughs> but then I always wanted to be a writer. I was always writing creatively all my life. I, I took I took creative writing as an undergraduate and and entered and uh, got a place in the undergraduate writing contest, the Mayhew contest, and. Every, in all of my undergraduate, all of my every everywhere I was in graduate school afterwards, I was always in a writing group. 
And I had the chance to work with people all the time who were unafraid to give honest critiques. And I think that was the best thing I ever had. When I was in Chapel Hill working on a master's in biostatistics, I was in a writing group with some people working on their doctorates in creative writing and we, we would compare stories. And I, I remember one of the guys that we passed out stories. And I read this amazing story by somebody and he said, well, what did you think? And I said, that was an amazing story. And he looks at me with disgust and he says, I know it was a good story. I want to know what's wrong with it. And that kind of infused me with this desire to get critique. So I worked with a group of Southern writers when I was in NC State that were writing pretty much standard Southern literature. But working among the the different genres actually, I think, expanded my ability to write. Just It's just always been a part of my life, getting critique and, and writing. I, I mean, I and I need that. I need people who will honestly critique me. Um, uh, and and that's helped me refine find my craft, I think. At what point did you start publishing? A, a short stay in hell <laughs> was my first book, and um, that became uh, popular. And 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 I think when I started blogging for By Common Consent, it was really helpful to attract people's attention. And then Riffs of Rhyme followed, and then I, I've written some science fiction. I've written some magical realism but my novels tend to go towards i don't even know how to classify it nobody does i can't i can't i can't find the right like the scholar moab it's it seems like a straight up story until you start hitting alien abductions and yeah. and um conjoined twin cowboys and it, you know it's just um I don't, magical realism is probably the closest to me um i think it's been a bit of luck. It's been, I'll tell, I'll tell a colleague um, in biology, you know, I'll, oh, you, you, you wrote a book. Maybe I'll write a book too, as if it just sprang. One yeah. day I was a biologist and I sat down, you know, I'm going to write a magical write some realism. Books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> write some yeah. books. That'll be, that'll be, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, it, um, what people don't see is this immense history in getting to the point where I could could write creatively well, but it was <laughs> it was a well, longer journey than it looks like. <laughs> if it was easy, we'd all be doing it, right? Yeah, yeah. I started outlining the plot for a novel uh, with like I started like kind of drafting like some character bios and backgrounds and things, and um, I, I even wrote like the little like a little two-page prologue. And then, I mean, I'm a historian with, uh, I use sources and footnotes and I have to corroborate everything I say. And then when I was given the the freedom to then just write whatever I wanted, it was terrifying and paralyzing. And uh, I still have all those notes. Maybe I'll return to it someday, but. Yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but creative writing is, it's not just something you can you can pick up. Well, let's turn to your this book, The Tragedy of King Lear, uh, The Goat Herd of the LaSalle's. So you adapt Shakespeare's King Lear, which has been done before, um, but you adapt it to a post-apocalyptic future of uh, the, in the American West of mega droughts, world wars, biotech, mutant animals, sentient <laughs> murder robots, um, and all of this narrated by an omniscient literal demon although a retired demon yeah there's <laughs> there's a lot going on <laughs> with, in, in this premise um so maybe first um why did you want to tell a story a, a, a western story in a in a post-apocalyptic western environment why was that the scene that you wanted to explore I, that's a really interesting question I think in my mind, after the Scholar of Moab, I, I thought of doing a sequel. And I had become fascinated with King Lear. I, I watched every version I could find. And I, I read all the, all the books about King Lear. And, and that, those two ideas began to bleed together. And then, of course, the demon appeared. <laughs> and it, it started... He, 
lived in Castle Valley, of course, and you know, as demons was, do, as demons do, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And and what I the, the story I wanted to 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 tell was complex enough i wanted a narrator who wasn't good or evil but but who had sort of abandoned both sides and every, every you know you you read in the book everybody told him you can't quit you can't quit being a demon you, you, you got to choose or you know you have to choose good or evil that, those are the choices and he's like ah, i'm done with that i am i'm just going to retire to castle valley and and become an omniscient narrator because I can I, I I'm semi omniscient I can read people's minds so I can tempt them and, and, and but now he's just so, an impartial observer yeah 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 <laughs> but so why, why this post apocalyptic uh, I mean this is now apparently like mega droughts extreme climate change the United States is broken up into the multiple countries. Uh, I mean, yeah. there's Estonian refugees in Moab. There, uh, Africa is now a freezing cold continent. I mean, it, all these things, like, mm -hmm. why, why that setting of looking at the West's future in such uh, kind of extreme ways? Oh, and and it's it it is extreme. I mean, this is kind of a worst case scenario. But one of the premises for that extreme weather was the prediction that was showing up in some of the models of the Hadley cells, which control where, where deserts are. Um, moving north, and, and, right? Yeah, it was moving north. And I, and I, I, I read that and thought, wow, I hope it doesn't ever get to Moab and all of a sudden, boom. You know, there it is. That's what creates the Sonoran Desert. And if you push that north far enough, in which I, this is, this is science fiction, but um, th that would wipe out the ecosystems that I love and that I care about. And and I, there were there were a lot of there's been a lot of changes that you can see driven by climate change. You you can see the warming. You can see the the effect on aspen groves throughout the West and in the LaSalle's, you could you can see the the effects that are happening in real time and this is one of the things i don't think people appreciate who get introduced to climate change sort of with the standard hockey stick stories that look at warming and satellite data and things and what they don't see is the tremendous ha changes happening on the ground um, and that, that's why it was so meaningful for me um, to have Mary O'Brien write the afterward, who's very familiar. She lives in Castle Valley and um, has, has studied the Aspens and the plant communities of the LaSalle very intensely. And those changes are happening. I, I took worst case scenario as, as a novel because it, it worked well. Um, and, and you can see worst case scenario is playing on several levels like the there is no limits to for example uh where the second amendment can go and so now the owner of the ranch is buying battle dredge technology yeah, military, that, grade, military grade military grade robot, murder robot, robots yeah yeah, yeah to, to protect his borders and, and and you know from his neighbor you know <laughs> this is kind of taking things Sometimes where our polarization and our things are, are, are heading. And, and so I would be shocked to see uh, this kind of scenario actually play out. But you look at things like the Eocene uh, thermal maximum, where temperatures rose 8% and they find crocodiles and tropical plants in the, in the Arctic at the time. And, the rate of carbon release over hundreds of thousands of years we're doing in a very compressed which is what caused the the eocene thermal maximum but we're doing it in a compressed way that's kind of scary we we have good ice core data that shows that the we've never seen this rate of increase in in carbon or temperature change it's it's so is this book a reflection of uh, an inner pessimism in you or just you kind of playing out 
worst case scenarios? Or are, are you pessimistic or are you optimistic about? It depends on the way, day of the week. Like on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm really pessimistic. But on Mondays, Wednesdays and, and Fridays, I'm really hopeful. So, you know, I have to portion out my thinking. I'm, jo- I'm joking. But <laughs> <laughs> are those corresponding with days you do and don't teach? Perhaps? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> And uh, and so um, for me, this kind of sort of future isn't probable, but it's not outside of possibility. And for me, I think the the central message of the book is the way that not so much what's going to happen, but the greed that drives that kind of possible scenario. It's the lack of feeling responsible for the world that we live in in ways as, as, as humans and the kind of greed that enters the world where essentially we quit caring about the land as long as we have lots of resources and money and 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 places to spend it those are those mm-hmm. those become uh, I think the roots of a dark future we look at your book here and it all seems so absurd and crazy but if you take some current policy and talking points that you know we hear in contemporary discourse and you kind of play them out like well what's the short and long-term effect of these it's it's no less absurd yeah um yeah especially in this sense of uh humanity shooting itself in the foot you know you know just like with (laughs) just the other day i was joking with one of my kids um trying to get them to brush their teeth Oh, no, no. It was trying to get them to put on sunscreen. And mm-hmm. I was like, did you put some sunscreen on? My, my kids are redheads with like th- the fairest, freckly, like sunburnable skin you've ever seen. <laughs> and I was like, did you put some sunscreen on? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, no, did you put it on very well? And they kind of pause. And I was like, listen, <laughs> like not putting on the sunscreen, it doesn't hurt me. Like you getting a sunburn doesn't hurt me. You're only hurting yourself by this behavior yeah. and i know you want to run outside and play with your friends and not spend the extra 30 seconds to put sunscreen on your ears or whatever mm-hmm. but you're only hurting yourself and, and I, I think there's an analogy there in some of our how we view you know resource you know the environment and resource use and right. extraction and all kinds of things you know in, in the end we're only we're only hurting ourselves um you do i did did it remind me though you whether you're a, a pessimist or not you do end this text on a very optimistic note you have um asmodeus he's this omniscient demon narrator and he's viewing this scene of perhaps you know the you know complete annihilation of the human race and maybe robots are they going to be the sentient ones who end up taking over or maybe it's you know these genetically modified other organisms um but you close out you say um Perhaps the actors will cast their eyes up and notice that they have the power to rewrite the script they've been handed and envision a new play, something meaningful, well, not a tragedy in which everyone of consequence lies dead at the end. Perhaps that is the only hope for this stage on which we are left to act out our dreams or our nightmares. I find that, you know, incredibly optimistic. You're, you've laid out this absurd, horrifying future possibility, but I like that you close with you know, we're not there yet. Yeah. And, and, we, and, yeah. and we, we have a, we have the choice to, to act out either our dreams or nightmares and them. Um, yeah. And I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's right. I think humanity has such beautiful aspirations and, and potential and opportunities, but we we're also capable of, of destroying so much. And not thinking about who gets harmed. This, for example, the, the the changes in the world where climate change is most pronounced isn't the people who are causing the most significant outcomes. And, and I think we're starting to feel it with the fires in the West and the droughts and the things that are happening all around us. And I, I don't know. I hope I hope the book just makes people think about what the cost of things are, where greed leads us. I mean, this was said by by Brigham Young that you know if if wealth corrupts, 
then yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not going to ever build Zion. And, and I worry that, and that's one of the directions of the book is that power and, and greed really are the, the root of so much darkness in the world. I mean, I think about the way that black and brown bodies are treated to in, in things like extraction technologies and in, in the ways that economies were built on slavery. And we so often don't pay attention to the roots of our the economic costs. I, I remember um, I uh, had a friend in the uh, business school who was really interested in the true costs of things, including the environmental costs. And he, he noticed that in all the economic models, there was a just a big black box that said resources, and then economics took off. And he didn't, he realized, that, oh, this big box that says resources that just has an arrow going from to really does have tremendous effects. And we have effects on that. And, and we have many examples of civilizations that collapsed because they didn't pay attention to that resource arrow. And those resources that actually, those ecologies that support everything that, that makes us and civilization and our economies possible. You already mentioned how thinking about Moab and your obsession with King Lear started to, to <laughs> meld. So, I mean, maybe you, you were thinking, okay, I want to do another book about Moab, maybe set in the future. Why did you decide, you know, it's going to be a, a King Lear adaptation is going to be the vehicle. For exploring that world, the, the the Asmodeus character was created a long time before I really started thinking about um, even thinking about King Lear. And this is the and the demon narrator. Demon, for the, yeah, for the listeners, Asmodeus. Right, right. Asmodeus, the demon narrator, and he 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 at that time had lived in Castle Valley, and. I started thinking about um, the main character, uh, King Lear, the goat herd, the LaSalle's started to frame itself. And I, I don't remember the moment exactly, but suddenly I realized he was a, a Lear like figure. And that the, the second that became apparent, then I thought, Oh, this can be a version of King Lear. Like a full and adaptation. Started, yeah. Yeah. Full not ad- just a, not just a tip of the hat by naming him King Lear, but go no, all it's, in. <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty King Lear. I mean, the whole plot is the same, except rather than declaring love, the, the he's making his kids write essays on, uh, you know, the, 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 why the land matters. And his, his ecologically minded daughter says, no, I don't have that vision that you do. It's not about raising transgenic goats on this land. And she's, she's thinking about what it would take to return the LaSalle to the ecologies that, of these, you know, early 21st century videos that she watched about aspens and elk and bears and, and, and deer living in the LaSalle. They're completely absent because th- th- it's just a ranch for transgenic goats. So I kind of, I kind of, once I made the decision that this was going to be King Lear, it was going to be a, a version of, of King Lear, and it's a pretty straight up adaptation. I mean, I, I think if you've read King Lear recently, you'll get a lot more out of the book because I'm, 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 I'm drawing on that extensively. I mean, it really is, it's not subtle at all. So, <laughs> um but then it, that from there, um, the demon and the version of King Lear, Lear just flowed. So, so what's really fun is you get the sense that there's this whole broader world, right? Because there's the Alliance of Western States, but then the Republic of Colorado, <laughs> I think you mentioned. And uh, and you throw out a few, some things about geopolitics and global geopolitics. And we get, I mean, so maybe you need to write a whole series of books. <laughs> not uh, Shakespeare adaptations, but just books set in this post-apocalyptic world. Cause you give us these hints of all these crazy things going on. And then you have these transgenic goats, which actually are, uh, that are, their skin is been, it's, it's human yeah. skin. It's been bred into them. And I, and you have like these, 
and, and, and I won't you know spoil it, but there's a significant plot line with naked porcupine transmutogenic mutated porcupine that have Barbary macaque monkey hands. <laughs> so just to give the listeners a sense, there are innumerable, absolutely crazy, bizarre things that without context, even in context, they're actually pretty crazy. <laughs> so I'm curious, are, are there a couple of these that um, that have like specific inspiration? I'm just curious, is it just from your weird demented mind that you came <laughs> up with these crazy things? Or did some of these uh, things, are they rooted in something where you actually drew from, you know, something you read or saw um, as inspiration for coming up with some of these fantastical things? Yeah, the, um, one of the things hinted at is widespread wars um, that, that sort of precede this world, which is kind of stabilized by that time. And I teach bioethics and there's lots of things in the book that point to the way that racism has played out in, in, in terms of like the skin goats and the things that people have done in sort of fragmenting the, the world we know today into, into multiple, multiple, um, trajectories that have become individualized so i won't i won't i i won't get spoilers either but <laughs> um uh i teach uh bioethics and we talk about genetic transformation the way that that it's it's becoming more and more feasible to do anything i mean the designer babies where you could put goat horns on a on a on a child if it became faddish i mean the second that that genetic manipulation can enter the world of fashion, it becomes a really kind of scary notion. And so um, a lot of those things just came out of, uh, to me, and this is I think, one of the horrors of the book, the things that are possible um, to do is really limited just by our imagination. I, I mean, we've got this new CRISPR technology which allows us to do almost anything. We can almost insert any gene into any genome and that gets kind of spooky. So, yeah. I, but isn't this how all, all of human history and civilization, this is what it's always been, right? With every technology, every advancement, it presents all of these possibilities, which as humans, we use sometimes, we, we, we could, for the yeah. limitless number of horrible things that we could do with it, there's also a limitless number of amazing things oh, we could do with it. Fact, and yeah. and our our track record is mixed, <laughs> <Exactly>. right? <laughs> no, that's exactly right. And and a lot of good's coming out of that. I mean, the 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 ability to to um, get rid get rid of many inherited diseases and things like. Uh, curing diseases like diabetes through genetic manipulation so there's yeah it's that's exactly right there's so much potential good and oh i was just about to give away the the, the uh transgenic porcupines um well don't give I, that okay. away we're quickly running out of time i'm curious as you look to the as an evolutionary biologist and a creative writing philosopher humanist um uh, also as, as as a religious person mm -hmm. you wear a lot of hats and i'm curious when you cast your gaze forward i, I don't think this is what you're seeing in the future no, no. <laughs> uh in your heart of yeah. hearts but what do you see i mean you're, you're just you're such a strange academic and creative mind which is why i thought it'd be fun yeah. to chat so what as people interested in the region what kind of thoughts might you leave us with to to ponder on I have more hope than this book depicts. Um, I have hope that we can, and, and this kind of plays into what you were mentioning about, um, you know, growing up in Moab, what, what was that like? And it wasn't until later that I saw the immense potential and value of having grown up in such a wondrous place. And I, I think my hope is based on that kind of awareness that this whole world is a wondrous place. Um, it's got so much, not just, it's got so much beauty. It's got so much, so many gifts. 
and those include spiritual gifts. And the, the, I, I, one of the things that that impresses me is how how much value there is in a melding of spirituality and the idea of valuing this this wonderful world it's it's emerged i i think we get too often tempted by a cheap creation view where where it's done with a snap of the fingers and it's all done but when we look at the time that went into this beauty and wonder and marvelousness of this earth this is our home I think we need to sort of meld our our ideas of how valuable and precious and fragile this world is. It, it's it's not hard to imagine the world that I depict that's so broken. It's been fragmented. It's divided into groups and and factions and and states and and um, we see a little bit of that today. But I think the one thing that I see is the land can not only um, needs our our care, but it can heal us. It's got a spiritual potential. It's got a, a healing potential. It be, it it, be, it has a very um, it has a transformative value that I think is underappreciated. And if 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 I have any final thoughts, they're along the lines of Asmodeus that that you read. Is that if we can look around and see how valuable and important and necessary it is for us as people, as spiritual people, as religious people, as as people who have the potential to do, as you've mentioned, tremendous good or tremendous evil. I think it's very hard to spend much time roaming the hills of the LaSalle's or Moab or anywhere, anywhere in Utah, um, Utah Lake. I mean, you can't spend a lot of time with the, the, the wonders around us and not feel a connection to that deep creation and those around us and see how valuable we, we each are and how, and how valuable and precious the supporting ecosystems that structure this existence are. Well, I think that's a positive note. Yeah, positive note for yeah. us to end on, right? We we can save the world around us, and we need to because right. it it saves us, right? It it has yeah. the power to to save us as 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 societies, but also yeah. as as individuals. Well, thank you for spending some time with us today, uh, and for the book and. Really look forward to seeing what else, what else you come up with. Oh, in thank you, years, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. It was, it was a great, great chance to, to to talk with you too. Those are, you brought out some good insights. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Take yeah. care. Bye. All right. Take care. Well, that's it for this month. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll subscribe. Please leave us a review on whatever app or platform you're listening through, or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates, leave comments, and communicate with me. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Rudd Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. We are an interdisciplinary research center that supports academic research and the promotion of public understanding of the North American West. We host regular public lectures, which we live stream. We have an annual funding cycle with awards, grants, fellowships, in categories that nearly anyone researching and working on the region from nearly any disciplinary approach or towards nearly any kind of final product can apply. Learn more at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D center.byu.edu. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Anderson, that's Anderson with an O, dot com. I'll put a link in the episode description. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, just about everything else, so you can direct praise or critique my way. I'm the author and editor of a number of books uh, and other studies on the West, Borderlands, Native Peoples, Genocide Studies, Religion, and the Environment. To contact me about the podcast, my own research, 
or just about anything else, head to bwrensink.org. That's B-W-R-E-N-S-I-N-K.org. Or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. Until next month, be well, be curious, and be kind. <laughs>